Uh, Mark Slayer, three-time Super Bowl champion, joining us. Uh, five foot ten and an eighth. Uh, Two hundred and seven pounds. Right. Uh, nine and a half inch span of his hands. Mm -hmm. Is Kyler Murray big enough to play quarterback in the NFL? All right, listen, it's it, the game has changed because you're playing 60-65% of the game is out of shotgun. He had less balls batted down at line of scrimmage than any quarterback in, in college football last year. I believe only five times was a ball batted down at line of scrimmage. So if you've got, I think one of the things you have to understand when you're watching film, guys that have great pocket awareness that don't stare at the rush but feel it, can slide, can find windows and deliver the ball accurately on time, whether you're 6'5 or whether you're 5'10, doesn't really matter. I find it fascinating, though, that, you know, people and, and scouts and, and just general people that cover the league are like, oh, he's 207. Now he's a legitimate, you know, first overall pick. Like, that is so faulty. That is so stupid. Like, one, are you going to be able to retain that weight during the season? Probably not. We used to play this game when I was playing for the Broncos, me and Tommy Nalen. So both Tommy Nalen and I would, would weigh somewhere between 84 and 88, usually, somewhere in there. So we'd get all dressed for practice, helmet and everything else. We'd step on the scale and get our weight. And Friday, oh, well, actually, it was hat days. We only did it on hat days. So we didn't have a helmet on. So hat days were if you won on Sunday, like, we, got not to we didn't have to wear helmets on Friday. So we'd be in shorts and, you know, jerseys and, and hat day, right? So we'd weigh ourselves on the scale before we went out to practice. And then we would, at, at, we would consume water at an ungodly rate. You'd be sloshing around out there to see who could gain the most weight during an hour and a half practice. By the end of practice, man, you've got to urinate. You're sloshing around. You're totally uncomfortable. Then we would rush right in to see how much weight we would gain. And I literally could gain 8 to 10 pounds during an hour and a half practice by just drinking water. We, I mean, we would sit there between the defense would be doing whatever they're doing, and we're just, you know, you had the little score bottle yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. We'd just be pounding water. Uh, it was, I mean, it was the most ridiculous thing. You have to do something to keep yourself entertained. But 207 pounds, like, who cares? You know, think about this, Doug. The last time I ever ran a 40 was 1989. I went on to start for 12 years in the league. The last time I ever did a vertical jump was when a team was testing me and all these. The last time I ever did the 225 bench test was in 1989. Then I went on to start for 12 years, and it didn't matter anymore. If it's such a great indicator of your football skills, why do we not do it every year? And by the way, your dad uh, still benches 225, reps, reps it out. I don't know if people have yes, seen he, pictures of his dad. His dad he, is, is built like a Greek god. Right. And, and we have there's pictures to prove it. Okay, so if that's not what playing quarterback's about, some of it's on film. Yeah, and some of it's also there's a there's a leadership component to it. Right? Absolutely, okay. Absolutely. You played with Doug Williams when your first Super Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. Well, no, Doug Williams I played with. It was before I got there, so I played with Doug Williams for a year, but it was I didn't win a Super Bowl with Doug Williams. Mark Rippin, and then two with John Elway. Okay, so Rippin, Doug Williams. That's three Super Bowls for those counting at home. Hold on, three. Uh, <laughs> okay, so who's counting? D D wait, I am. Doug Williams, yeah. Mark Rippin, John Elway. Yeah. Tell, and tell me if I'm wrong. When they walk into a room, all three take over a room in terms of personality, persona? Um, yeah, in different ways, though. Explain. Like, different ways. Like, like Rippin was happy action, fun, love, you know, just goofing around guy. But when it came time, you know, to play on Sunday, man, he was dialed in. He's ready to roll. You know, Elway was more subdued business-like. So that was kind of his. But when he walked into the huddle, it didn't matter what the situation was. When he walked into the huddle, man, you knew you had an opportunity. You could be down 14. And you're like, okay, we got him right where we want him. Let's roll. Like, that's the kind of, that's the kind of presence he had. Um, Doug, was, Doug was very much the same way. I remember the first game I ever started was a game against the Philadelphia Eagles in the vet. They had the number one defense. They had, I mean, it was Jerome Brown and Mike Pitts and, uh, you know, Reggie White and Clyde Simmons and Byron Evans. And, I mean, they were loaded, Dudes. right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting on the, I'm sitting in the bus, and I'm scared to death. I mean, I'll just flat out honest. I am scared. I don't know if I belong. I honestly don't. And uh, I knew it wasn't going to be a lack of effort that was going to get me booted out of the league, but I didn't know. And I'm sitting on the bus, and Doug Williams walks on the bus, and he walks right by me. And all of a sudden, he stops. And you can feel his presence behind you. He stops. He backs up, taps me on the shoulder, and he said, hey, listen, the only difference between you and them is they've had an opportunity to make a name for themselves. And he goes, and today, you're going to make a name for yourself. 
And he goes, I have nothing but the utmost faith in your ability. I went out, got a game ball, and 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 wreaked havoc. You know, got in a fight, the only fight I've ever been in. It was awesome. I mean, it was <laughs> like it was because Mike Pitts. I was I was dispensing justice on Mike Pitts, and Mike Pitts is so frustrated because he thought he was going to be player of the game and right. have you know four sacks and go straight to the Pro Bowl, right? And I'm wearing his ass out, and Mike Pitts takes a shot at me, and I swear to you, I my wife's over there. She she can tell you. I took double hands. I tried to break his freaking jaw. I mean, I just wham. And then Ernest Biner came flying and tackled him, and it was melee, and everybody's pulling us apart, you know, and flags are flying and stuff. And it was just my way of saying, I may be a 10th rounder out of Idaho, but you're not going to punk me. Like, I didn't come here to get punked. And, and I, I bring that up because one of the, discuss the, the I think the biggest discussion point is people want to say, well, Baker Makefield was in the same system. And Kyler surpassed him statistically. And, like, there's a difference between Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray. Like, Baker Mayfield, you know, you, you people may know, not like his persona, but there's a persona, and right. his teammates seem to love it. But yeah. in Oklahoma, teammates love it. In Cleveland, teammates seem to love it, right? There's they a do. get behind me, right. you've covered him, you know it. And, look, he won every high school football game he ever started in the state of Texas. He is a legend in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy who started as a freshman at A&M, lost his gig, and then goes up to Oklahoma and comes out of nowhere, wins the Heisman Trophy, and leads them to another Big 12 title. Right. So he is accomplished. He is no dummy. He's a bright kid mm -hmm. as well. Right. But there is a difference in the personality, in the, the presence that quarterbacks have. Sure. And I don't know if he has it. And I, I almost feel like we're questioning the wrong things about, uh, about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think there's – I think the, the, the combine's a joke, okay, first off. It's, it's a test of athletic ability. It has nothing to do with your football ability. I always say this. Football is easy for football players. It's really hard for athletes. And all you're figuring out here is who's the athletes. So it goes back to the film. It goes back to the intangible stuff, how much you're willing to prepare, how much you're willing to work, what you're able to, um, you know, to understand and how quickly you can make decisions. So all those things are, are more important. I think it's medical is the most important thing you're going to do here. Two is personality. Let me talk to you. Right. All the 40s and all that garbage is exactly what it is. If we lined up and, and ran 40s and the team that ran the fastest 40s got to win the, the – you know, look at the, the, the fastest 40s in football. Like the fastest 40s ever re recorded at the Combine. You know, John Ross, how's he done? What, he's got 22 catches they over wanna, the last they two are, years? They want to trade him in Cincinnati. <laughs> right. I mean, so and, – and there's a bunch of other ones that fall into that. Like, so you got to take that stuff with a grain of salt. But I'm 100% with you. I don't know what he is, but there's not one cookie-cutter guy that can lead a team. Baker Mayfield – Baker Mayfield, you walk into Cleveland, man, there is no doubt who's in charge. You watch a Friday practice, I mean, you know, it's John Dorsey's like, that dude's all balls. Like, that's who he is. Like, he is in charge, and, and everybody gravitates towards him and loves him because of that. So you got to have whatever it is, and it comes in all kinds of different forms and fashions. But I think the bottom line is you have to be authentic. And then the other thing that you have to be able to do is play. Yeah, if you can't play, right? If you can't play, you can't because you can't because you, you can't fool right, players, right? right. Like you I remember this the story you had, and tell me if I'm wrong. Um, you're in Washington, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, and you guys draft true. Heath Schuler in the first round, right? And in the seventh round, uh, what was the guy's name? Gus Farad. Gus Farad did the headbutt later on in right. the cement yeah, yeah. wall, whatever. And didn't you walk up to somebody? Very and say, first day, very first day of 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 minicamp. Said, boy, I tell you what, first the seventh rounder is going to be ten times the quarterback of the first rounder. You can just see it. And sure enough, you know, Gus Farratt went on to play for 15 years, and, and he sure flamed out. And, and there's a lot of, of processing, how quickly you can process information and all those different things um, that are important. I think authenticity, the way you lead authentically is really important. But the bottom line, you got to play. And John Elway once told me this. Your guys' job is first and second down. I, I leave that to you guys. Go out, have fun, play. You know, be great. My job is to convert on third down. That's what they pay me for. They don't pay me to play on first down. They don't pay me to play on second down. They pay me to play on third down. And that's what a quarterback has to be able to do, play on third down. Can you do it? You're going to find out. L last thing, yeah. uh, uh, you have your own radio show in Denver. Obviously, John Elway is a friend of yours. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. He's I sometimes closer than other times, <laughs> depending on what I say. I understand. Yeah. So your uh, my thoughts on the Flacco thing were, 
I actually think it made sense. I think it's a short-term solution. Sure. A guy who is solid is fine. They can still go out and try and find the next guy. But because he's not going to make a ton of money, they can fix some of the other holes within this roster. Yeah. What was What's your reaction to the Flacco move? My, my reaction is he's better than Case Keenum, but very much like Case Keenum. If you don't fix all those holes you talked about, um, you're still going to be on the outside looking in to the playoffs. So you've got to fix a lot of things. Here's the issue right now is you're going to have Case Keenum and Joe Flacco. You're going to have a bunch of dead money from Case Keenum. So you're playing, you're paying essentially Aaron Rodgers pay to Joe Flacco to run your football team. And you look at them right now, they've got free agents. I think they have four or five free agents right now that uh, Bradley Roby doesn't look like he's going to be back. Matt Paradis, I don't think he'll be back. Uh, uh, Max Garcia, Jeff Hireman, there may be one other guy. If all four of those guys are gone, they won't have one draft pick on their team from the 13, 14, or 15 draft. You want to talk about the mismanagement of the draft. And they've got two players from the 16 and 17 draft that actually can kind of contribute as starters, Justin Simmons and Garrett Bowles. And Garrett Bowles is a question mark. Right. So, I mean – they have not done a great job last year's draft, notwithstanding, because it was really good. So, to me, you still have a ton of work to do to be even in to be even mentioned as a team that's going to compete for a playoff spot. Yeah, and you have the Chargers that might have the best talent in the league, and the the Chiefs, right. who might have the best young quarterback in the league. He's Mark Schlereth, the three-time Super Bowl champion, given so many thoughts on the National Football League. Of course, you see him covering the NFL on Fox. Stink, great stuff as always. Thank you, buddy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.